Um, yeah, good morning, David Gordon is uh, my name. I'm a social scientist working for Africa Environmental Research. And I'm uh, very happy to be invited to talk a bit more about uh, some of the, of the research uh, that we're doing. So the topic for today is how can we help prepare regions for the future? Um, I'm going to uh, share some experiences that we have for Europe. And while doing so, I will also reflect on um, yeah, opportunities uh, for Australia. Uh, so my talk today uh, will be on the challenges that regions, both in Europe as well as in Australia, are facing at the moment, um, how nature-based solutions can be one of the ways out of that um, um, impasse of these uh, issues that they are facing. Um, and I will dive deeper in the how to design and implement nature-based solutions. There are so many aspects related to uh, how to de design and implement. Uh, but for today, I chose to look at the human side. I could have chose for the economic side, uh, for maybe more um, like the technical and the FX uh, aspects. Uh, but I thought it would be good to stay with my own core expertise, which is uh, the human side of setting up uh, collaborations to design and implement nature-based solutions. And at the very end, to reflect on uh, opportunities for Australia. Uh, so, um, I work for Wageningen Research, uh, which is in the Netherlands, but I'm based here in Darwin already for several years. And I have experience that when I say that I'm from Wageningen, people don't know it. Uh, so, I thought uh, it would be good to spend uh, two slides on who we are. Um, we are from origin, uh, an agricultural um, um, university. Um, so our uh, agriculture departments are quite strong also uh, in the world and we have a joint uh, mission is that is to explore the potential of nature uh, to improve the quality of life. The village of Wageningen is uh, rather small um, but the university and the, the staff and the, and the students take up a quite large part of that uh, population. Um, so our university has different departments. On the one hand, we have the professors, the postdocs, the PhDs, really much focused on uh, education. So we have a, a agri-food uh, group, animal science group, environmental science group, plant science group, and a social science group. So it's quite limited in terms of disciplines. Um, but we have at the moment uh, 13,000 students. It's uh, much less than the CDU. Uh, but our staff, which is divided uh, between the university part as well as the research part, is at the moment uh, 8,000 people. So Wageningen Research, uh, these people are not uh, engaged in education. They are full-time researchers working from local level to international level. Um, most of our funding is public funding, uh, coming from the Dutch government on the one hand, the European Commission on the other hand, uh, but some of our science groups are also heavily um, uh, collaborating with, uh, with private partners uh, like uh, uh, food companies and uh, agriculture companies. Um, so for Wageningen Environmental Research, we have the mission to, uh, to make the world greener with nature-based solutions. So uh, our people um, join forces and expertise to work on that. Uh, we are divided into uh, five programs. Uh, we focus on biodiverse environment, green climate solutions, green cities, sustainable land use, and su sustainable water management. Uh, because all of us are focusing on the same thing, I will also present a few uh, results of research for my, uh, for my colleagues. Uh, we collaborate uh, quite intensely together. In my presentation, I will introduce uh, abstract concepts um, and I do think these, uh, these concepts are really useful to solve issues that the regions are uh, facing. Concepts are abstract ideas, and like this um, optical illusion, if you use the concept, you suddenly see uh, reality from a different angle. And by doing so, you get a deeper understanding, uh, you are able to communicate uh, insights, um, and you are also able to see uh, solutions that you were not uh, able to see before. So the use of concepts is quite, uh, quite uh, useful uh, when you try to solve uh, regional problems. So regions, both in the Netherlands as well in uh, Australia, uh, are having a heavy time. A lot of things are coming uh, and taking place in the region. Uh, look at the, our own region here, uh, Northern Territory. Uh, we have crime issues. 
uh, our economy is not performing uh, so well. We have biodiversity loss, um, sometimes a bit too hot. Um, it's going to get uh, more wet, sometimes also too dry. Um, people are struggling with the cost of living. Um, and the energy transition, of course, it's a goal that uh, globally has been agreed. So we need to do something with that. Uh, we have the same issues in the Netherlands and everywhere in Europe. Regions are really struggling uh, with how to solve these uh, multiple problems at the same time. Um, so it's it's a really hard time for regional policymakers to find a way out of uh, of these uh, complexity. And it, there is at the moment an extra complexity compared to let's say uh, ten years ago. Um, one is that. Um, Given that there are so many issues that uh, need to be tackled, the different policy uh, departments are making their own policy programs. A very good intention, but they do it fragmented and separate from each other. So these initiatives are, are often not well coordinated and are claiming the same land. Uh, they have competing claims and they're not helping each other. So that, that's really an issue that uh, makes things um, extra complex. Second thing is um, community protest. Uh, people are not taking the type of development anymore. You see uh, protests coming up uh, everywhere. In the Netherlands, protests are coming from farmers. Um, they are not taking the strong, strict environmental regulations anymore because they cannot see how they can make business anymore. Uh, so uh, we have a lot of protests um, from, from the agriculture sector. Um, and then um, last but not least, climate change. Uh, we are developing for uh, conditions that actually doesn't exist in, anymore. We keep on developing in the way that we have developed in the in the past year, uh, 10 years, uh, but we know that in the future um, it will be better, drier, hotter. So we need to revise the way uh, that we're developing. So one of the concepts that you can use to try to find solutions out of this uh, complexity is to work with the concept of key community systems. It's a concept that uh, the European Union has introduced as part of the mission for adaptation. And that uh, says that um, the social and the economic systems um, are, um, uh, how well they perform are connected with um, the quality and the, and the dynamics of the natural system. So um, society, there are a few key community systems that are crucial for human welfare and human well-being. The European Commission has identified the following one, the way we manage water, um, the land use and the food system, uh, the health and the well-being system, and the critical infrastructure. If these perform well, um, society has a good life and we are able to, uh, to grow and have, have um, um, yeah, have welfare, um, but um, the underlying principle is that the nature, natural system uh, need to perform well, because if, if that is not well connected, then you are getting trouble with the way uh, you are developing. So you have that issues with health, you get issues with critical infrastructure, water management, um, land use and food system. And that same reasoning we do see back um, in uh, the SDGs. The um, Stockholm Resilience Institute has transformed the UN SDGs into the wedding cake. I think you all have, you have seen that, but it's uh, according to the same principle. It's a principle uh, that say, make sure your natural system is um, up to date, it's performing well, and then your, societal, uh, your society will thrive and your economy will uh, flourish. So that's an assumption. Um, and that is not happening uh, today. So the following concept is uh, system transformation. If we want to um, have these systems in balance and connected with each other, it is needed that we have system transformation. And system transformation refers to the fundamental change in the structure and the functioning of the system. And it's some, for Europe, it's uh, something different than what we have done in the past decades. So the past decades, we had issues and we tried to solve it um, by tackling the symptoms. But uh, the, in, the, in the past years, the European Commission said for now, if we really want to find a way out of it, uh, we need to change the underlying dynamics. We need to change uh, the systems. Um, the Donella Amidos uh, is a good book uh, to read. Um, because uh, she has uh, succeeded in popularizing uh, system thinking. And this is, um, yeah, it's a 
it's, it's one of the uh, key reading uh, materials uh, if you want to work on system transformation. Nature-based solution is seen as a way uh, to connect again the natural system with the societal and the uh, economic system. So one example is, uh, I think uh, you can see it outside, it's uh, parks and trees. If you would not have had the park and the trees, you would not have had the shade. It would be much hotter outside, um, maybe also not nice, and you probably would have been working from home. Uh, so these green elements, they, they have an, uh, an added value um, that, that is often taken for granted. Um, but if you work more with green, you are able to, to solve not only the biodiversity issues, but also uh, a number of uh, social and economic issues. Um, when you com um, compare the definitions that the European Commission is using at the moment and the Australian federal government is using at the moment, you see a slight difference. So the European Commission say that nature-based solutions are solutions that are inspired and supported by nature, and they connected them uh, with the social and economic uh, benefits. Um, so um, when you read that definition, um, you see and you feel that this is a, a systemic, uh, systemic solution. Um, when you look at the definition from the Australian federal government, then you see that nature-based actions um, Nature-based solutions are actions that protect, manage, and restore. So there, um, nature-based solution is seen as a direct action for the management of ecosystems. But I'm following um, the Australian government already for a few years, and when you compare the current definition also in projects and in practices, you see that it is um, um, stretching, it is enlarging, and I think it's... it's um, um, it's a matter of time when, when these two definitions are, are equal or the same. Uh, what you see at the moment is that the, the concept of nature-based solution in Australia is, is uh, stretched from um, um, solutions to uh, tackle climate mitigation to also um, yeah, tackling uh, biodiversity issues as well as uh, uh, resilience. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's a very... Uh, definition uh, focused discussion. So if you look at nature-based solutions, you could be able to categorize them, to structure them. Um, in uh, Europe, at the moment, we use the, these three categories. So you have solutions that um, focus on the better use of existing systems. You have solutions that um, modify or manage ecosystems. And then you also have solutions that actually design or manage new ecosystems. Um, I think for Australia, you should go for a categorization uh, that works uh, for you. Um, we see that a lot of projects are aligning with the categorization that is promoted by the IUCN. Uh, IUCN uh, categorize nature-based solutions according to uh, what they deliver uh, and their functions. Um, it's a, it's a very uh, practical way and, and an understandable way to, to categorize the different uh, nature-based solutions. Um, but still also for the Netherlands, we came up with our own uh, categorization. Um, so also for, for Australia, I would uh, strongly advise work with what works for you. Um, and and if, if the international category, categorizations don't work, just change them um, because it's uh, very important that, that the people on the ground uh, understand them. So for the Netherlands, um, interesting, for instance, we call bio-based building, we call that uh, nature-based solutions. Um, bio-based building means that you uh, make use of um, 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 uh, agricultural waste, for instance, to make uh, new materials for, uh, for building. Um, and that is clearly uh, a way to, to earn money uh, with the nature-based solution. It's a way to innovate and make business out of it. Um, green, blue infrastructure, it's uh, what you see here outside, also uh, allows um, for private uh, sector to, uh, to earn money. Um, but for instance, the restoration of uh, river mouths, this is clearly something that uh, will be paid by, uh, by public uh, funding. It's very difficult to attract private money for um, nature-based solutions uh, like that. Um, so there is also a difference in, in uh, who is uh, participating in implementing and designing these nature-based solutions and how can you 
uh, gain money out of uh, out of these uh, nature based solutions because in the end you want the economic system also to be connected uh, with the natural system. So some nature based solutions allow to do that and some uh, not. Um, so what is happening at this moment is that there is a quite heavy investment in designing and implementing nature-based solutions for systemic change. Uh, there are a number of projects, I only name a few that uh, we are involved in. Uh, one is uh, in the Netherlands itself, the Dutch government uh, has, uh, has uh, allowed 70 million euros for 10 years to spend on the project NL 2120. Um, there they will test uh, and implement nature-based solutions and try to uh, make a business model out of it. So it's, a, it's really a piloting project. Uh, and then out of these pilots, after 10 years, the assumption is that nature-based solutions are mainstreamed and that the economic system in, in, uh, in the Netherlands can uh, earn money uh, out of that. European Commission um, is also heavily investing in uh, nature-based solutions uh, as part of the mission on adaptation. Uh, the mission on adaptation aims for 150 regions and communities to become climate resilient by 2030. At this moment, already 308 regions and communities have signed up. So the ambition is, uh, is much higher. Uh, there's a whole portfolio of projects under that. Myself, I'm involved in the, in the next three, uh, Decimet, Embracer and uh, Acadia. So what is happening in this project that has started uh, um, uh, late last year and early this year is that we collaborate with, uh, with regions. Uh, we, together with them, uh, de design tools and approaches for, um, for nature-based solutions, to design them, to implement them, but also um, to just yeah, uh, improve uh, policies, uh, to, uh, to encourage behavioral change. So it's a whole set of approaches and tools that we co-develop with the regions. We do that with five uh, demonstrator regions, and then each of these projects also have replicator regions. So after a few years, these replicator regions are going to do the same thing as the demonstrator regions, but without support. We deliver the tools, and they are going to try it out uh, on their own. Uh, if they succeed, then all these tools uh, will go to the mission on adaptation and will be ready uh, for the 308 regions to, um, to make this uh, systemic change happening. Um, so in these projects, um, something um, fundamentally different is uh, taking place. So uh, in the past, we this was the model promoted to build resilience. So what, what what's happening, you have the global climate scenarios, the regional climate scenarios, and you confront that with the socioeconomic system uh, that is, is uh, in, in that uh, area. So you have a map and then you indicate uh, where is the vulnerability, where is the impact going to take place. And then usually together with stakeholders, uh, you brainstorm on what could be the solutions to tackle the impact. So you have impact and solutions. It's a, it's a good approach. But it's an approach that did not allow for the systemic change to happen. So for the systemic change to happen, uh, the assumption in the project at the moment is um, we're not going to make scenarios. We're not going to uh, try to find out what the future would, like, would look like. No, together with the stakeholder, we're going to brainstorm what the future is that we want. So we just, we just, Together with stakeholders, we we um, we try to imagine um, how life could be uh, in the longer term. So, what is the life that we want to have? Usually, what come out of is of that is a happy life, healthy. Um, so these these common uh, common uh, topics. So it's just the future that we want, and then um, the the hard work is to trace it back. If you compare it with the situation today and what you want in the longer term, for instance, what it been in one hundred year what needs to change what are the pathways that lead to that future that we all of us want um so uh in the projects um uh, we had a kickoff meeting so uh, you see here 56 uh, um, policy makers and experts were in the room and the question was uh, when we are going to design and implement uh, nature-based solutions, what do you expect to be the biggest barrier? And uh, you see that most of them um, answered the governance. So how 
can we get people to collaborate in order to work with nature-based solutions? And that's a, that's a question also in, in other systems transformation. How do we make sure that the people are going uh, to collaborate? This is the uh, stepwise cycle that you see coming up in almost all of these projects, also in the policy documents. Uh, so it's setting the scene, analyze the system, envision the future, develop pathways, promote uh, proposed actions, assess the impacts. This sounds really a lot like the conventional policy cycle. So what is different about this? What, what makes this um, a way to uh, uh, achieve the system transformation compared to what we have done like decades? Uh, the, the change here is that uh, new partners uh, are involved in this um, uh, collaboration, in, this, in the discussion actually, and that these partners embrace uncertainty. There are things that we don't know and that's okay. Uh, so we make solutions and, and um, uh, pathways that allow for this uncertainty to be there. Um, and the focus is very much on monitoring. So keep track on what is the effect of the solution compared to the context. If you have new information, so uncertainty changes, um, that you then again go to the loop. Okay, do we need new action? Do we need to change thing? Uh, so this, this group of people um, is, is going into a reflection and a learning mode. And everybody um, is also yeah, embracing that, that um, um, yeah, uncertainty and, and the willingness to learn and to reflect. So what you do not have in this situation is, is a shame and blame. Um, sometimes the group of people come up with solutions that do not work and that's okay. As long as you learn from it, as long as you uh, are, are able to change it uh, and, and willing to change it, um, then, then it then should be fine. So it's really the type of the collaboration that uh, is different from the past. These are all assumptions, guidelines, and now in these projects we are testing it. How does it really work in, uh, in practice? Um, so what we already can see is that conversation is crucial. Um, you need to talk with each other because people are, are, have different views and perceptions and without a conversation, and a conversation is not like an online, um, I type something in, it is a face-to-face -face conversation together with each other, very intense, uh, to make sure that these people understand each other. And with these people, that's another concept that is uh, coming into uh, the, the climate change uh, field is the quadruple helix. It's a concept coming from regional innovation um, and the quadruple helix say that uh, in order to, to make system change happen, society, government, knowledge uh, institutes and the business community have to work together. So you cannot exclude society when you make plans for the future. You cannot uh, exclude, uh, for instance, the Knowledge Institute because they, they have uh, information that could, uh, could be uh, valuable. So these four partners need to have a place in that uh, conversation. Uh, so the conversation helps to change perceptions, exchange perceptions, build relationships, uh, and also empathy. When people talk with each other, they are much more friendly and much more kind than uh, when they are um, <laughs> behind their uh, fighting uh, walls. Um, so this is uh, the underlying assumption to come to what, what is uh, called collaborative uh, governance. I see that in Australia, the word collaborative governance is, uh, is, is commonly used. Um, but a, an extra step is uh, transformative uh, governance. So transformative governance is a type of co uh, collaborative governance, um, but it's really focusing on trying to change the systems. While collaborative governance is, can stay within the existing systems trying to make things uh, better. So now I'm going to, to dive a bit deeper in, uh, in the human side. Yeah, I could go into different steps and more technical, but I have chosen to go into a, a more human side because it's very easy set there. Eh? You have to bring people together, but these people, uh, there has been intention for, for years, for decades. Uh, so what we see in the regions that we're collaborating with is that I find it very scary uh, to be in the same space with, with let's say their opponents. Um, they, they fear emotions and they also fear a backlash. So it's, for policymakers, um, it's it's um, it, it's a very scary thing uh, to do, 
Um, but what could help is to see emotion not as, as something between people, but it's a way, a source of information. So if you see people becoming angry or sad, or it's, it's, it means something. It's a value that they try to express via their body language and uh, via their behavior. And, and using that type of concept helps you to, to, yeah, to not be uh, affected or attacked by that emotion. The person is trying to say something to you. It's not about you. It's about what this person uh, tries to uh, make clear. Uh, in these first stages, what we often have the tendency to do is to talk about the problem and the solution. But for transformative governance to happen, you have to take a step back. You have to have the conversation with each other, what the place means for each other. We, we live here. Uh, we, we, some people are, are here for, for years, others are new. So what does the place mean for you? Um, and um, yeah, what do you hope that the place will be in the future? And having, having like a, 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 peop, a person to person conversation, um, deep listening is, is crucial. You have to make sure that people are able to listen to each other and to truly understand it. Um, this uh, example where we uh, tried to do that uh, was in, uh, in Kenya, in the Menengai uh, forest. It's uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the local, uh, local landowners in the future project. And um, yeah, it, it, it has been a start of a, of a long-term collaboration uh, in the Menengai forest in order to come up with uh, ways to make money out of that uh, forest. Um, another thing in, to do in the beginning is, um, for instance, also the causal loop diagram. We often assume that people see systems like they are. And science say it is like this, so that it, then the system works like this. Um, but um, in reality, people have different perceptions on how systems work. So it's a loop diagram. It's a series of interviews that you can do with different people, uh, stakeholders in an area in order to um, make their mental model uh, that they have with regard, in this case, the water and agriculture system. Um, and here you see, um, this was the mental model of the uh, local authorities. And the other one was the mental model of, uh, of the water boards. And uh, you are not able to compare this because it's too detailed, but you do see that the scale is different. They, they uh, look at it from a different scale. Um, and also the dynamics where they pay attention to are different. And the result is that if you bring them to the table and you do not discuss that, they assume that the other ones see things in, in the same way, but they don't. Um, so that is often a, a reason for frustration. Eh? When you put people together and um, yeah, then they get frustrated because the other one doesn't understand it. And, and then uh, that storming is happening. So when you bring a group of new people together, they always go through uh, a process. This is coming from, from just team development. So in the beginning, it's forming. They learn to know each other. They're very kind and friendly to each other. And then they uh, gradually move into a stage where they, um, where they where there exist like uh, value conflicts or perception conflicts because they see the world in a different way. And they start to challenge each other. They start to uh, trigger each other. And that's the storming stage. And you see that in all collaboration happening, or even in your own collaborations, you have moments where you get so frustrated. Um, and then it's, it's really key that you stay. It's a normal stage, you have to go through it and you have to try to go through it as soon and as fast as possible uh, because uh, the next stage is the norming. You accept each other's uh, differences and you start to find a way to work uh, together. Uh, and when you're working together uh, and you do that over a long, long period of time, hopefully you come into a stage of uh, working as one, it's a performing. So step back to, uh, to the storming stage. What are the things that can happen in that storming stage is uh, people are using arguments. And when people are talking, they are doing that uh, intentionally or inintentionally, but uh, something is happening. So I uh, used a few uh, few um, arguments or phrase uh, that, that were used in the, in the anti-news. Um, so one type is, for instance, stereotyping and blaming. Uh, there was someone who said that uh, battling crocodiles, um, you, you need to battle crocodiles to grow, uh, to grow uh, the anti-economy. 
Uh, so you have crocodile that's stereotyping and you have a group of people and you call them crocodile, that's stereotyping. Uh, same what uh, the former chief minister did with the teals and the trolls. You, you have a group of people and you put it in, in a kind of a box. Uh, so that's stereotyping and blaming. Um, but another example is the more recent example with um, the documentary from, uh, from the water grab. Um, there, uh, in that article, is that to former judge Tony Young. Um, so, by by referring to the judge who says it's highly impossible, uh, it's claiming authority. And then after that, it said it's uh, it's uh, it's bordering on ridiculous. Um, it's common sense. You you do not plant cotton for uh, for seeds. And so the way that it's uh, said or written is like yeah, everybody knows that this is not the case. So it's appealing to common sense. And uh, the one on top is uh, yeah, appealing to, to science, uh, uh, using science as a reason why things uh, should push through or not push through. So when people are talking with each other, uh, these arguments can have an effect. Um, and when you are in the storming state and the change passing data, we are aware of that and we, we need to manage that. We need to make sure that the arguments are going into a positive, uh, positive uh, atmosphere. These, these things are usually um, going into a, into a tension and a conflict between schools. So you need to come up with arguments that, that help to, to find common grounds. Uh, the other thing that happens are very complex. Uh, we grow up in different um, social economic uh, environments, different uh, cultural contexts, and the result is that we, we find different things important. Um, in, an, in Belgium, uh, these value conflicts are underlying uh, the flood management uh, policy. So you have a group of people that say, no, um, when you want to live in, in, a, in a flood area, it's your responsibility. We're not going to pay for your protection. While well, another group of people say, no, it's the government who has allowed you to, to live there, so they need to protect it. So there is a, a strong value conflict, and there is no right or wrong. A value conflict is there. As long as you acknowledge it and work around it, uh, you, can, uh, you can find a way out. Uh, the other one is very relevant for nature-based solutions. You have a group of people that say, no, we need to make sure that the measures work, no matter what happens. So they need to be uh, controlled measures. Uh, but when it's a nature-based solution, it's a natural measure. And yeah, sometimes it's not shown yet that they will work in every circumstances. So that, that's very difficult to accept for the people that uh, really align with uh, control as a value. So that as a social scientist, there are ways that you can use in such a, uh, a collaboration process to work around these uh, differences of uh, values or interests. One example, uh, if you have uh, a small value, uh, value, value differences, then you should be able to come up with a narrative or storyline that align uh, with the different values uh, in, a, in an area. But when you see that the value um, uh, conflicts um, are, are intense and the values are very different, um, then make it explicit and uh, talk with each other about it. Um, but education also play an important role um, because the education is, is the basis of forming of, uh, values. Um, so these people uh, come from different uh, disciplines that come from private sector or from, uh, from science. Uh, and then suddenly they need to talk with each other. So you need to find a common language that uh, all of them are able to understand. And in our project, we found visualization a useful tool. Um, so when we're talking about the sy systems, we always try to make a visualization of this. Uh, and this visualization coincides uh, with a, a short description on how the system uh, works. And yeah, so far, so good. It's this. Um, uh, has worked um, for, for the different people to, uh, to make sense uh, of, uh, of the systems. So then we take the next step and this group of people say, yes, we, we want to make a vision together. We're going to do that. Uh, key is uh, development principles. Uh, I have not seen them yet for, for the Northern Territory. Uh, we are now making them uh, for the Netherlands. 
Uh, in our projects, we we came up with uh, with proposals for development principles. So we say like if we want to build a future, this natural system needs to be the starting point. Uh, the economy needs to be circular and climate positive. Uh, society needs to be uh, nature inclusive. So it's a number of principles that a group of stakeholders agree uh, to align with when they are going to. Um, to make this uh, vision for the future. Uh, we also uh, made, uh, together with students, um, a vision for Europe uh, 2100, uh, and there the principles are, are different. So also when you want to um, do that in your own region, try to uh, find the principle that works for your stakeholders. So with the with help of these principles, the people are starting to talk with each other. They take the map, they take uh, their vision of the future, and they start uh, to throw. Can happen in very different ways. This is coming from post it So it was a bunch of students working two days together um, on, uh, on uh, how the Mediterranean region should, should look like. They did a bit post it and the landscape architect uh, made a, a nice uh, visualization out of it. And the other one was made by the local stakeholders themselves. They have a, a paper and they start uh, to draw. And this one um, is the Netherlands uh, 2120. Uh, that was the result of two day workshop of experts only. Um, people that um, has worked in the Netherlands on the, on the landscape systems for, for ages. And after two days, uh, they had, uh, had a map like, uh, like this. And this has been a start of, uh, of a two year uh, discussion dialogue within the Netherlands, um, how we can make this happen. Um, Together with the stakeholders, uh, they, they build a narrative when they are going to make such a, such a map. Um, and apparently it gives them hope. So when we were talking about climate change uh, a while ago, it was mainly urgency and fear that we, uh, we, uh, we uh, had as a result. But with this uh, long-term vision, it's, uh, it's more uh, hope. And hope is needed to bring, pe to, uh, to bring people into action. But now we're on the stage of really implementing uh, solutions and their empathy is needed in the communication. Uh, we need to understand what are the solutions that work for everyone, not for uh, only a group of the people. So empathy is, uh, is going to uh, be an upcoming uh, concept uh, for sure in the, in the next uh, years. Um, I wanted to present um, this. I think it's a very inspiring uh, region. It's central Denmark. Um, they are confronted with a lot of rain. They are going to have much more rain uh, in the future because of climate change. And instead of being uh, scared of that and uh, being in a panic, they said, now we take that as a challenge. We bring together the Knowledge Institute, uh, society, um, the government, and, um, and this one, and the private sector. And we use that as a source for innovation. So they are now making products and, and services um, that they are going to test in their own region. And when they work, they are going to sell it uh, over the world. Um, so also for uh, Darwin, I think the heat is, uh, is a really nice source for innovation. If you bring people together around the heat, um, I think you might be able to, to create new products that the world is uh, looking for um, because it's going to get much hotter also in Europe. So last uh, but not least, um, what, what, um, what for Australia, what ha I have I've been here for several years now. Uh, so where do I see the opportunity uh, for Australia? So for a nature-based transformation, there is a need for urgency. Um, I do think the urgency is felt there. The regions are really struggling. Uh, you have the bus, bush summit where there was really a call like we need to change. Um, there are several other uh, initiatives uh, at the moment that clearly say, yeah, we, we need to collaborate, we need to do things differently. And you have the skills, um, working with adaptive pathways is coming from Australia a uh, long, long time ago before we uh, started to use it in Europe. It was here in Australia, it was CSIRO with, uh, with a, um, a group of other people that have worked with, uh, with these concepts and uh, they are very experienced and skilled. Uh, CDU also have really good skills um, to to uh, to work on nature-based solutions. So yeah, I think um, just give it a try, and um, yeah, I think the, the situation is ready for it. 
but hopefully uh, policymakers will uh, will take up the opportunity as well. At the moment, there is a reform of the I think it's the Nature Nature Act, the Nature Protection Act. Would be great if nature-based solution is part of that. I'm not sure. I'm not completely following that. Same for the adaptation strategy uh, plan at a uh, federal level. Would be great the nature-based solution uh, is integrated there. And investments, uh, dialogues cost money. Uh, so yeah, we were lucky in Europe to get the money, but also for Australia, it would be, uh, I think, really helpful uh, if, uh, if um, policymakers uh, would fund such an initiative. Um, so yeah, maybe uh, within the university, you can bring students together and make the vision for an autumn territory uh, within 100 years and use that vision uh, in the region as a starting point uh, for, for long-term discussion to show that the future can look like uh, differently than uh, where we're heading to at this moment. And then um, uh, Professor Lindsay Hutley also did send me this initiative. I think it's an amazing initiative uh, that should certainly be funded. Um, and I, I would certainly advise also to have a social component in it. Um, but yeah, these, these things are, uh, I think, really good um, to happen. So yeah, that's it uh, from my side. I hope it was useful. We have about 10 minutes left for questions, if anybody has questions for Ingrid. <clears throat> um, so we had a, a session, I don't know, a few, a few weeks ago with um, industry and, and other people around the northern beef industry, and we asked them to look at uh, what they think the future might look like in 25 years. What do they want that to look like? Um, and they found that very difficult to imagine mm -hmm. the sort of things that might be available and possible yeah. in 25 years. Um, and I was wondering how you managed to facilitate people who aren't necessarily used to thinking about things in the very far very future. Far future. Yeah. Um, what I what what we usually do is to say like what do you want, and then they start from their own business, and then they are going to to describe their ideal business. Um, like in a in a perfect situation, that business would look like this or that. Then you would put it in the future, knowing that climate change is taking place, probably by the virtual or the decline. Socioeconomic system will be slightly different. That can be regionalization or globalization. So then you put that 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 dream that they have against these uh, things that you yeah that could happen. And then step by step trying to take them uh, through that uh, process, I think. But uh, it's a it's a, it's a skill and a thing to learn. And in the Netherlands, it's they did it before I started working there already. So um, I think the more you do it, and the more they do it, the easier they find it. Hopefully. <laughs> uh, just two questions. One, just brand that is it fair? Is it fair to comment that some people can't think outside of thinking of their own little box? Yeah. Where some individuals have the capacity to think. Yeah. And so it depends on who you engage with. Yeah. I, uh, we, we feel the same. Um, what, what we usually do is try to engage all of them and then automatically or naturally some people you, you lose. And that's okay. Some people are really um, good in thinking further, uh, but it's really key that, that what, what this smaller group has created is, is consulted with a group that is not able to think in that way as well. So the question is, um, how do you find the centre? Like, you have people at extremes on either end, you know, either development versus greenies or whatever. And it's the the people on the extremes who get the attention of the media. Yeah. And their, their interest is about conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The people in the centre become disempowered. Yeah. So the people on either end, be it left or right or whatever, tend to grab, tend to grab the the yeah. agenda, especially the public the mm -hmm. agenda, especially the media, yeah. because the media's interest is conflict. Yeah. Yet the the only way to progress is to find the centre or somewhere in the middle and marginalise the people on either, on either end of the street. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's really difficult. It's a it's this power power balance or imbalance within a group of people. Um, uh, I cannot like come up with uh, with with the trick, uh, but what I uh, feel that that has worked in the past and in in, in uh, our experiences is uh, to take people out of their. Um, it's not about them. Uh, it's about the future. It's about this region. They will. They will be that um, <laughs> for sure. So um, to 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 get them out of their stake and out of their interest and try to put the region and the future of the region. Uh, but it's difficult, um, and it will take time and probably also in the in the in the background some one on one uh, um, trust building. Yeah? Uh, hard work. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ingrid. That was pretty good. I'm wondering if you can comment on like my perception of nature in Europe is that there's a much greater embracement of provenance with you know people who've been there for a long time and yeah and um you know with con contemporary culture. Uh and a challenge in Australia is that we've actually got three perceptions of what nature is. There's um nature with no people. There's nature with Indigenous people as a whole unit, and there's um, nature production. So, like, the beef sector <coughs> has a really strong argument on saying that they're a you know, nature-based industry. Um, but they're also uh, excluding um, a major component of what the Indigenous group says is nature, which is them. Yeah. Um, so, you know, are you able to comment on that? Because I think I think an issue here is that we we don't actually have a definition of nature. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do I have a comment on that? I, I find it a very, it, it's certainly different uh, in Europe. It's, it's uh, yeah, we are much more free to use nature for whatever we want. And uh, do I have a comment on that? I think it's a unique situation for Australia, probably also in uh, Canada and some other countries you have it, but it, we don't have that in, in uh, Europe, not everywhere. Uh, so, yeah, um, I think in, the, in this uh, collaborative process, you need to discuss it together. I, I don't have a solution on, a, on how to, to, to deal that, I think. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, what I've... From what I have seen so far, what I would do if I was the Northern Territory, I would use the way that uh, indigenous people care for country and their, the, the way that they relate for nature. I would try to, to bring that into the way we develop our non-indigenous uh, system. So for instance, the hospital um, or yeah, the parks, for instance, and, and that, like then you come up with other solutions and other concepts. Eh? For instance, also in the, in the hospital, eh? using uh, uh, indigenous uh, native species that has a role in the healing process. Um, yeah, why not uh, plant it there? So they, they are uh, making use of it, but also the non-indigenous people, they can learn from it and maybe they get inspired by something and new new innovations products might happen. So. Yeah. Yeah, great talk, um, great to hear you speak. Um, do you think, just following on from this comment here, do you think there's another the difference between Europe and Australians' approach to, to nature is one, not just of those three framings, but also that there is a, a, a relative abundance of nature in Australia, yeah. whereas in Europe it's, it's very much residual layering, which is... Yeah, a, a, a real price put on it and a competitiveness of it to be as productive as possible. Yeah. And you hear framings in the Northern Territory like, well, we don't need to worry about overdrawing the border and of these sorts of things because only 1% of the territory has been cleared, which epitomizes that framing. How can we how can we change that going forward? Is it a is it a temporal framing? Um, and asking for people to be States people versus politicians in a short time frame. Do we have to change our temporality of nature mm -hmm. to conserve it for the future? Yeah. How do we do that? 
<laughs> yeah, let's find out together. <laughs> yeah, it's another context there. Eh? And um, I, I brought in the experiences that we have so far from the project, but you have seen it's uh, 24 regions and all of them are, are different in terms of culture and politics, uh, but they, they don't look like Australia. So yeah, I... Uh, to to be able to answer this, um, yeah, we need a we need a few good uh, brainstorms discussions and bringing bringing some expertise together. I I I wish I had an answer in my pocket, but uh, yeah, you you can really work with time and space um, in order to to bring people together. So. Uh, yeah, when you're talking about now, I'm going to cut that tree. People don't want it. But in the longer term, we can say like all the trees will be gone and they will be replaced by something else. And then people say that's fine because they will not be here anymore. Um, and um, then, then they are more willing to collaborate. Just a very, very blunt example. <laughs> but time is, is your um, way to, um, to get people uh, together. Space is the other one, zoning. Uh, for instance, uh, agricultural development, it needs to take place, but indicate where it is allowed to take place. Uh, because otherwise, people think uh, this agricultural development will take over all the nature. It's never going to happen. The, the soil and the water is not uh, good enough to have agriculture everywhere. Where can it go? Where can it not, not go? And, and decide to get around that and stay within that zone. Uh, do not go out of that zone. Um, and then you should be able to, to make progress. That's absolutely correct. But you've still got to deal with the people on either end of the streams. We want to clear everything. And the people at this end who don't want to move. The true question I find is how do you get to, how do you get some acceptance in the middle? Yeah. And um, we can't have development anymore without this sort of approach. It's yeah. just untenable. Yeah. It doesn't matter that, you know, I, I walked in Europe and I walked across England last year and I was astounded. To see no residual forest, nothing. No. Yeah. Eighteen days, three hundred kilometers. Yeah. One coast to the other, nothing. I live in, I live here, and and that's all I see. You know, I was just astounded to see the difference. Yeah. But without a doubt, the question I find is, you're absolutely right. But you got the people on the outside, the extremes who want to, who don't want to come to a compromise, or, or not necessarily a compromise, but a position. 